From the fact that you clicked on this video, I can tell that you're at least a bit interested in microcontrollers. But what even are they? Why do we need them? How to program them? What is the difference between a microcontroller and a microprocessor? Well, I'll try to answer these questions throughout this video and try to give you an overview of the microcontroller world. I'll do my best to make this video the video I wish I had when I started my journey. But first, a little disclaimer. I'm gonna skip a lot of details throughout the video, so if you wanna learn more about a certain topic, try googling it or ask a question in the comments and I'll do my best to answer your question. Also, let me make it clear that that this video presents the facts from my perspective and can therefore be highly opinionated. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. I might dislike something you would love and I'm allowed to like something that would make you puke. There's no reason to dislike something just because some random guy on YouTube says it's bad. That said, let's get started. First thing first, what's a microcontroller and how does it differ from a microprocessor? To keep things simple, let's say that the microprocessor contains just the processing unit unit and the microcontroller contains a processing unit along with different peripherals that interact with the outside world. These peripherals are for example GPIO ports, analog to digital and digital to analog converters and also various peripherals are used to interface with different low-level buses like SPI, I2C or UART. Another difference is also the fact that microprocessors usually run a full-blown operating system like Linux, I mean GNU plus Linux, whereas microcontrollers are usually flashed directly with the application code which runs indefinitely from the startup. Nowadays, microprocessors a lot of times also come packaged with peripherals and other hardware on a single chip. This is called SOC, so the line is blurring a tiny bit. But roughly speaking, the difference is still as we said before. There's a lot of choices when picking a microcontroller which in my opinion is a good thing, but it can also be overwhelming. Let me try to give you a few guidelines. The first thing that defines the choice of microcontroller is the hardware requirements. In other words, what other hardware are you going to need to interface with? I recommend that you gather your requirements first, so you won't need to swap out the microcontroller in the middle of the project. The second thing, look for any development boards that might contain your chip. Having a plug and play development board can make your life a lot easier. Good examples of development boards are of course various Arduinos. If this board doesn't exist, however, you can also create your own. But before doing that, I usually look if the chip comes in a true hole package so I can plug it into my breadboard. To wire up a chip or create your own schematics, look into the chip's documentation. There should be an example wiring schematic somewhere. To create your own prototyping board, you can use KiCad to do the design and an online PCB manufacturing service like JLC PCB or PCB way to create your circuit. Some of these manufacturers can also solder the components for you. That for example is something I did for my computer mouse project. One recommendation before you do that is to also look at how are you going to be flashing the firmware onto the chip. Look at the various debug probes and see if they are supported by your chip. A very important thing when picking a chip is the community and overall support for different software. It doesn't hurt if someone builds something similar like you and you use the same chip. It also doesn't hurt if the chip is supported by third-party libraries. More on that later though. And finally, I would really like to make emphasis on the documentation. Look into the documentation before committing to a chip. Search for something that's called reference manual. A good documentation can make a huge difference and trust me, you're going to regret saving that one cent on a chip with bad documentation. Since we're already talking about hardware, let me just say a few words about the architecture of the chips. In the past, you had mostly 8-bit chips like AVRs from Atmel or PIX from Microchip. Frankly, these are still suitable for a lot of projects. By the way, AVR chips are the ones present on most Arduino boards. Another very common architecture is ARM, which I think is becoming more and more popular. These chips are pretty powerful and because ARM is used basically everywhere, there is also very good tooling support. Another benefit, in my opinion, with ARM boards is that ARM has a standardized way of connecting to the chip with the debug probe called Serial Wire Debug or SWD for short. 
An alternative to ARM has become RISC-V, which is similar to ARM, but basically has open source instruction set architecture. In practice, this can mean that the chips can be cheaper and also they may come from less known manufacturers. There are also many other architectures like Extensa, which is used by the ESP boards and many, many more, but I just wanted to list the ones which I mean are the most common. Overall, I'd say that if you stick to the rules of picking a chip I mentioned earlier, architecture shouldn't play a huge role. I'm saying this because if you define your requirements correctly, you're most likely to pick a chip with the suitable architecture either way. If you really want me to state a go-to architecture, my suggestion is to just pick ARM. This might change to RISC-V in a few years though. Now that we covered the hardware part, let's focus on the software. Let me just say that as someone being a software developer at my day job, I'm not impressed with the overall ecosystem for microcontrollers controller software support. The difference in software support for microcontrollers can feel like day and night across different manufacturers. So believe me when I say these web devs have it easy. Let's define the software layers in terms of abstraction. This is just the categorization from my point of view, so don't quote me on that please. At the bottom we have the lowest form of programming, which is often referred to as bare metal. This is essentially a do-it-yourself approach, where you either aren't using any libraries or you just use something like a file with names of registers that point to their addresses. This kind of implementation is done either with C or assembly or sometimes even both. Now, you most likely won't be doing this on any major projects, but it's still a very good idea to learn how stuff works at the lowest level. Let's take an example of toggling an LED with an AVR microcontroller. Here's a simple C program that does that. To toggle the state of the LED, all you have to do is set or reset a bit in the appropriate register. Now, how do I know which bit to set in which register? Well, I trusted a random guy on the internet, uh, I mean, I read the docs. Do note, however, that in this example, the main function isn't the first thing that executes when the chip is being powered on. The first thing that executes is actually a startup procedure where we need to initialize various parts of the chip first, such as, for example, the interrupt controllers. This startup routine is usually supplied as an assembly file from the manufacturer. All right, let's define the second layer as an abstraction at the chip level. This means that you still have to know which registers are which, but you don't necessarily need to know which bit to flip exactly. You still have a good amount of control at this level, so it's usually the go-to layer for most projects. This layer usually comes in form of either manufacturers or third-party libraries. For example, for STM32 chips, you have the low-level and HAL libraries from STM itself, but you can still use a project like libopencm3, which which is an open source community project. There are also third-party projects with very good support for various RTOSs, which a lot of times provide their own abstraction. If you don't know what an RTOS is, I made a video looking at a tiny implementation of one. Anyways, here's an example Blinky program with libopencm3 and uh, STM32MCU. I'm gonna call the topmost layer the experimentation layer. You might also call it a toy layer if you like. I'm talking about using the Arduino environment or MicroPython for programming. You sacrifice a lot in terms of performance on, and flexibility by committing to this level of abstraction, but on the other hand, nothing can beat this layer when it comes to rolling out prototypes. Also, let me just say that for a lot of projects, you would probably be just fine with sticking to Arduino, if not even MicroPython. Just so you get a feeling, here's a blinky in MicroPython. Okay, that was probably a lot to take in, but there is one last thing I want to talk to you about, and that is the development environment. When I said that the choice of a microcontroller can have a huge impact on software support, I didn't mean just the libraries, I also meant the support for the development environment. The most obvious choice to develop your program in is to use an IDE from the manufacturer. Almost all manufacturers have one and most of them have the same features. Here for example is how Microchip's MP Lab looks like. You have everything set up for you. You set a project up using a sort of graphical wizard and the project sets up a build system and libraries that you need. Then you have a button for flashing and debugging right where you need them. On top of that, some manufacturers like ST provide you with a code generator. It can be either part of their IDE or standalone, like I have it here. Essentially, you pick a chip you have and you can just click on an individual pin and initialize it however you want. This utility then generates initialization 
authorization code for you so you don't need to worry about it. This all sounds great, doesn't it? Well, unfortunately, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. For one, these projects hide away the details which, in my opinion, you as a developer should know about. On top of that, some manufacturers also provide their own compiler, and my humble opinion is that you should just stick to GCC or Clang. Also, I'm the type of guy which doesn't like to be enforced which editor to use, especially when this editor is Eclipse. And oh boy, the code generator. I like the concept of code generation and I think it does have its place. But number one thing when it comes to code generation is to keep it separate from the code I write. And just look at how the output from STM Cube MX looks like. You're meant to write code in between these comments. And to me, this is just insane. Also, the libraries that come from the manufacturer are a lot of times poorly designed. I'll leave the judgment up to you. Luckily, there are alternatives. If you've paid attention to software support when picking a chip, there might be quite a lot of alternative options. The alternatives to look into are the Zephyr project, ChibiOS and FreeRTOS. These are quite large projects with RTOSs, but I recommend you look into them either way. Who knows, they might be a good fit. There might also be a completely different software stack which you might find interesting. For example, the Rust programming language is getting traction in the embedded world. I also used it for for my computer mouse project. And I'm gonna be honest, at first I didn't see the value in using Rust for embedded systems at all. My opinion was that there isn't much Rust could bring to the table. Rust is all about safety and flipping bits directly in registers is inherently unsafe. Well, when I looked into the language a bit more, I found value where I didn't expect. And for me, the biggest thing Rust brings to the table is that it tries to standardize the abstraction over the peripherals across different manufacturers which essentially means that if you design your program in a good way, changing the microcontroller in the middle of the project might not be as big of a deal as it otherwise might be. One last thing which I want to share is that you can use your own editor like VS Code to do professional embedded development. And you can also get auto-completion, diagnostics and debugging capabilities as well. I'm using NeoVim for all my projects and I can also use the debugger there perfectly fine. So we've come to the end of the video. I hope I gave you at least a bit of a kickstart on your journey to becoming a microcontroller expert. If you'd like me to talk more about a certain topic, please let me know. I'm thinking of making a video about setting up your own work environment from scratch. Let me know if you'd like to see that. Anyways, I hope to see you again. Have a nice day. Goodbye.